Good morning. I am Carrie Dumas, President of St. Paul's Ambassadors. I am honored to introduce our distinguished speaker for today, Dr. Catherine Meeks. This well sought after leader currently serves as the Executive Director of the Absalom Jones Episcopal Center for Racial Healing in the Atlanta University Center. Dr. Meeks taught African American studies for 25 years at Mercer University in Macon, Georgia, where an interdisciplinary approach to issues of race, gender, and class raised the consciousness of the students. Following her tenure with Mercer, she served as a lone executor to the mayor's office in Macon, where she directed the mayor's Youth Violence Task Force. In August of this year, she was awarded the Presidential Joseph R. Bowden Lifetime Achievement and Service Award. Her community involvement activities includes many, and I would just name a few. Founding director of the Lane Center for Community Engagement and Service at Wesleyan College in Macon, Georgia. Founding member of the Center for Racial Understanding, organizer of, work of the citywide marches against violence, organized and implemented major community wellness fairs and events such as weight loss programs for indigenous women and food and clothing drives. Dr. Meeks is the author of eight books. Her most recent book entitled, The Night is Long, But Light Comes in the Morning, Focus on Meditation, on racial healing. St. Paul's, join me in welcoming Dr. Catherine Meeks. <laughs> there are all these references that talk about if you have just a teeny bit of faith, particularly the one that always strikes me is if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you can tell a mountain to move and it will. So I want you to think for a few minutes with me about figur figurative mountains, because surely Jesus did not necessarily mean that we will tell the Rocky Mountains to move and they will. So evidently, Jesus is always using symbols and stories and analogies as we know. So I want you to think with me for just a few minutes about mountains that have been in your life, uh, situations that rise to the occasion of being mountainous. Do you follow me? Think about those kinds of situations. And what did you do in the midst of that? Did you pray? Did they... Did things change? What changed? How did it change? What's your recollection of faithfulness from God in the midst of the mountains that we do have? Because we do have many hurdles in front of us that do feel like mountains. And oftentimes we don't quite know how we're supposed to get through it, around it, over it, whatever we're supposed to do. And I think anybody who's human on the earth is strugg struggles from time to time with just being overwhelmed. You want to throw up your hands. A lovely poem that I, that I love to read a lot says, and you want to just lie down and tell God you have a headache. You know, so I think we can all identify with being in that space. But we also know very quickly when we're in that space that that's not the space God intends for us to occupy in any long-term way. I think that having a few moments like that probably don't exasperate God very much 
because I think God's probably seen everything. But it does exasperate me sometimes when I think, let me just crawl under the bed and forget it. You know, but so what do you do? And how do you stand up? And, and then there are those times when it feels like the mountains have no intentions of moving. They have no intentions. And eventually, you decide you're just going to keep walking because the mountain, you don't quite ever walk into it. You see it, and it won't go away, and it's there, and you have to deal with it, but it, won't, it doesn't keep you from taking the next step, but it doesn't get far enough away from you for you to feel like it's gone, but you go anyway. You pick, keep, up, keep putting one foot in front of the other in spite of the fact that if you go three more steps, you'll walk into this mountain. That is called walking by faith walking by faith and believing that the next space will be there even though when you look ahead a little bit it's not there it doesn't make sense to you so what what is going on inside of us as human beings when we're doing all this stuff and what's going on inside of us as human beings on any given day anyway i am somebody who believes so deeply in the inner life I believe that if you don't pay attention to your inner life, that you won't have an outer life. You will have something you constructed, but it won't be the life God meant for you to have because we have to bring both our inside and our outside together to live in the ways that God wants us to live. I remember when I was a student in college, And you know, when you first start learning about stuff, you're just really kind of crazy, actually. And I was just going to be this, I don't know what kind of prayer person I thought I was going to be, but I would get up in the middle of the night and go in my closet, literally go in my closet, because it was big enough for me to do that, and sit and pray. And, And, you know, I was young, and I didn't know a whole lot. I have no idea who I was really even praying to. So I want to ask you, when you're praying, who are you talking to? It's an important question because we have constructed so many different kinds of images of God. So it's important to know which God am I talking to? Is it the God of my mother, my grandparents, the culture, the church? It's a good question. It's a really good question. And I love to say, even now, at age 76, and all of these years of walking with the God of the universe, that understanding God is above my pay grade. And if anybody thinks that they have gotten a complete understanding of God, I really would like you to come and talk to me afterwards. So in the midst of mystery, what do we do? We're here on this earth, in this space, given these responsibilities to be co-creators with the God of the universe, and sometimes all we can barely manage is getting through the day. And so what do you want from us? And when we talk to you, who are we talking to? And what do we expect to get back? I can never make a talk anymore without bringing up my wonderful mentor, Dr. Howard Thurman. And Dr. Thurman says that no matter how many petitions you put in front of God, and no matter what happens with those petitions, you can always know for an absolute fact that you will be answered. Maybe not what you ask for, Maybe not the external stuff, but that you will be answered. The person who is praying will always be answered. Now, many, many times we say, if the petition doesn't turn out the way we want it, God didn't answer us. We think God didn't listen to us because we already had a set of expectations that God didn't choose to honor. 
so then if, if that's the, the God I'm praying to, I'm really looking for an errand runner. And I don't think God is the cosmic errand runner. I don't think so. So this is my effort to understand something about who am I talking to. The other habit that I had was to be, you know that doll that came out way back in the day called Chatty Cathy? I'm Catherine and I was Chatty Cathy. And I'm sure God said, when is she gonna hush? Just chatty, 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 chatty. Always constant chatter. You know, I need this, I need that, I want this. Can you help me? Blah, 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 blah. And then, and then there was the, well, let me just sit and be silent time. And that didn't work too well because then I was always trying to get my math done while I'm sitting trying to be silent and holy. And then I realized that I was trying too hard to be holy. That basically what God is interested in is the fellowship, the relationship, the willingness to listen, the willingness to hear. So if, if it is true that God answers us when we pray, we then must put ourselves in the position to hear what the answer is. And if the answer is not, you know, I wanted this person to get well from this disease and the person died. And so then I have to tell myself, well, maybe death was healing. You know, that's nonsense. That's not what we believe. We prayed for somebody to live and they died. And so we can't fake ourselves out and say, oh, well, that's the best healing you can have. How many of us are ready to have it? <laughs> We're not. So what you have to say is, I, we asked God to heal this person and the person died. And we just hold that in this hand while we hold the truth that God is faithful and we don't understand the mystery. It bothers me that people reduce prayer to some, it's almost like magic. It's not magic. There's nothing magical about the journey with God. It's mystical and not magical. And too many folks have gotten into the magic of it. You know, um, I, just, I just want us to step back a minute and say, we're walking by faith with a God that's mysterious, who loves us, and we believe that, and we affirm that, and that's why we gather in this place and around this table. But we have many questions we cannot answer, and we hold the mystery and have faith anyway. That's why faith is so crazy. It's really crazy to just keep holding to this when everything around you says it doesn't make any sense. But that is the call. And God wants to be in this relationship with us, in this conversation with us. I, I was at annual council yesterday, and we were spending all this time in a debate about some language in a resolution. And I sat there and thought to myself, so God is holding God's breath, waiting on us to figure this out. <laughs> right? I mean, so important. We're so majoring in the, in, the, in the majors here. We've got all this, you know, we've got all of our structure and all of our stuff that we have to maintain. And God wants us, I think, to be in some kind of relationship. I think I got, I went through college with, with that kind of, you know, uh, young and kind of silly trying to figure out who, who am I going to be, but always hanging on to being faithful. And then I left, I was in California and I left and came to Georgia and lived, I've been living in Georgia now for the last 50 years. When I came here uh, 50 something years ago, my mother was so horrified. She couldn't believe that I had left LA to come and live in Georgia after growing up in Arkansas. And I didn't know what to think about it, except that I was following what felt like the great leading in my soul. And I am very clear that that is what I was doing. And this is exactly where I was supposed to be. And I learned, I have learned so many things over these 50 years, 
But one of the most important things is to just walk on the path with God and be in conversation. And I don't have to be too worried about most things because God's got a bigger view than me. God gets a, has a bigger picture than I do. So when I find myself being crazy and worrying, I know I need to sit down and say to myself, check in with your inner community and see what's going on. What is it that you are allowing to disrupt you so much so that you're forgetting that the God of the universe can be counted on? And then I think when I finally had a child is when it really got clear to me. If my child was chattering at me all of the time, are you going to give me breakfast, mama? Are you going to give me lunch? Am I going to have lunch money for school? Am I going to have books? Am I going to have clothes to wear? Am I going to, am I going to, am I going to, can you give me? I would be saying, what is wrong with you? <laughs> when did you decide that I wasn't going to take care of you? When did you decide that I'm going to let you go to school with no clothes on? And it dawned on me that God was looking at me the very same way, saying, Really, my daughter, really. Do you think I just sent you to the earth to be desolate and to not have what you need and that I've forgotten about you, that you don't, you don't matter? Do you have to chat at me all the time about stuff? Just listen to me. Just walk on the path with me. Just be affirmed in knowing that you're my daughter and you're okay. I think as people who are descendants of folks who, have, who were held in bondage, that many times it's difficult to come to grips with how worthy we really are. And there are some pieces in our, in our liturgy that I don't say. I do not proclaim being unworthy to God. I am worthy. You are worthy. We are worthy. We are God's creation. And God lives in us, and God wants us to have life and have it more abundantly. And how do we do that in the midst of a culture that's constantly denigrating and saying, you don't deserve to have this. You don't deserve to be this powerful. You don't deserve to be who you thought you should be. There is, again, that dance and the necessity to do something, to have some balance, and to live in the world holding the paradoxes, which is very, very difficult for us to do. Because when we get right down to it, we're all kind of fundamentalist. We kind of want things to be cut and dried. This is true, this is false. And then I know which one I can choose. But the truth is, this is true and this is true. And I have to figure out how to walk in the middle of it. So God is, and God is to be trusted. God is faithful. And the, the other image that just so powerfully impacts me is God loves you like a mother. I don't know. You know, if your mother doesn't love you, you're in really bad shape. Really bad shape. And to be loved in spite of yourself. Doesn't matter what you look like, what you talk like, what you think like, how you act. It doesn't matter because you will always be loved. That is the promise that God has made. So given those facts and living in that kind of promise, how should I be standing in this world that tells me you don't deserve to be here and you don't have, you don't understand all of the workings of the outer world well enough or you wouldn't have that faith you've got? Because that's really what fear is about. Fear is to undermine our faith. And praying and being in connection with God reminds us that there's somebody bigger than us in the universe looking out for us. Oh my goodness, Howard Thurman. If you don't know Howard Thurman, I'm, I'm pretty sure you ought to know Howard Thurman by now. But in case you don't, please go look him up. But Howard Thurman says, 
that really what prayer is about is speaking to the hunger in our hearts, the hunger to be closer to God, and God's hunger to be closer to us. And in the midst of that, of course, we talk about the stuff we need. You know, I am a sufferer of an autoimmune illness, rheumatoid arthritis. I was told 30 years ago, by now I would be in a wheelchair. But see, I don't believe that people can make pronouncements like that because you don't know what God is about. And so here I am. You know, here I am. And it's not, it's not the, it's not, it's not magic. I've had to do a lot of work, you know, surgeries, medicine, dietary changes, acupuncture, many things. So praying doesn't mean that you get to sit down. You don't get to sit in the kitchen at six o'clock begging God for dinner when you've got a paycheck. You go to the grocery store. You cook. And sometimes I get so weary when we just say, well, we just need to pray. It's like saying all we need to do is love each other. Those two sentences just drive me crazy. Because it's not that simple to love people. And what do you mean when you say that? And when you say, well, we just need to pray, does that mean you intend to go home and pray and tell God somebody out there in the universe to fix it and then you forget about it and you don't you don't have anything to do with it i think that it's a lot, little bit more i think that it that when we pray we need to be willing to be part of the answer what is the answer and what am i willing to do to help make that answer real in the world so if we ask for peace we then must be willing to work on being a peaceful person. If we ask for uh, security in terms of economic stability, we then must be willing to work and be generous and to keep our hands open to have the gifts that God has to give to us, to come to us. So there is something we have to do too. It's, an, it's a very active kind of business, this business of praying and seeing the power of it. And all of you in this room have been one time or another seeing an oasis open that you didn't even know was in front of you. Or a door opened on a wall that you didn't think had any doors on it. Or a window opens when you didn't think that you thought you were in a windowless room. Because that is what God does. That is who God is. So we all have to be students here. We're never going to not be a student. We're all learning. And until the day we die, we'll keep on learning, hopefully. I think that keeps us going, to be willing, to stay open, to be curious, to, to let God show us what we haven't seen before. Today is the day that the Lord has made and we've never seen it before. And we have no idea what this day will bring. And in the morning, we get up and we start over and over and over. And instead of dreading a day, we need to graciously embrace this is a new chance here to see something I've never seen before. If it's nothing more than the way the clouds look or to understand something that you didn't understand before, or to be more generous, or to have a surprise. You know, God loves to be surprising us. And I think that we ought to, in, in closing, I want to say this. I think that we ought to imagine that God is at least willing to be as good to us as we are willing to be good to other people. You know, sometimes we, we live as if we think, God's going to get us. God's not out to get us. God is out to love us. And in the, this moment when we live in this world where evil has just
brought itself out and walked across the street and waved his hands and said, I'm here, what you gonna do about it? I think we need to come back to that quiet place of relationship with the great God of the universe, however we understand God of the universe. And I'm not here to try to tell you how to understand that because like I said, that's God is mystery and always will be. But I, I'm thinking about Sojourner Truth. You know, she, she, she was in a church and Frederick Douglass was up at the pulpit talking about how bad everything was and how much, you know, black folks needed to be worried because this was way back then when things, things could get pretty rough now, but we haven't seen rough because we didn't live when Sojourner Truth was living. So she, um, Frederick Douglass is making all these declarations and Sojourner Truth is in the back of the church and she says, Frederick, is God dead? Is God dead? If God is not dead, then we don't know what might happen next. So I say to you here on this day when there are all kinds of things for us to be concerned about. We have a country that's in a mess, though we did, we, we could be worse, I guess. We have ourselves sometimes that are in a pretty good sized mess too. And we have family situations and people in our families that cause us great hurt and sorrow. We all have different uh, degrees of, of de de degeneration and deterioration in our bodies, though I want to hasten to say our souls are not degenerated. It's really important to remember the soul does not degenerate. The soul does not age. So I'm 76, I feel like I'm 26. Yeah. I do. And I'm here to do whatever I can do for as long as I can. If I live to be 100, I'm, hopefully I'll still have a few of my marbles and I can go around and do something. But uh, the point is, as we confront the realities of the present moment, what does prayer have to do with it? What does prayer have to do with you and your life? It does not matter that we have these lovely ladies over here that are the warriors maybe to pray. And it doesn't matter that we do all of the, the noonday prayers and the evening prayers and all of that. None of that matters. What matters is what does it have to do with you? What does it have to do with you? How does it impact your life? Day to day to day. How does it make you a person that other people can see the face of God in? God bless you. Thank you so much.